Hi, Alan Freeman. I'm going to answer some questions which have been given to me by Alexander Dushaninova. I hope I pronounced your name right. So the first question you asked me is, is the hegemony of the USA finished? Now, I think you probably get more of an answer about that from my partner, Radhika Desai, who's just written a book called Geopolitical Economy, in which she says not only is it finished, but it never was. That is, the idea of hegemony was something that the US itself constructed, and we believe that globalization is quite similar to that, essentially as a policy, not as an explanation, in which it said you should accept our hegemony, you should accept what the institutions that we control tell you to do, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and so on, because that is the best view, because that is in some sense a law of history. So what's going on is actually a serious distortion of knowledge because they're taking something that they want, that they need, and they actually need because their country is in decline and has been in decline for some time and never achieved the kind of domination that British imperialism achieved. Uh, because they haven't achieved that, what they do is they construct policies that they then try and impose on people, explaining that that's somehow really the march of history, and it's not the march of history. There is no necessity for American hegemony, it never really existed. If it did, they wouldn't, want to, they wouldn't need to make war so much. There is no such thing as globalization, not in the sense that it gets taught in the academic textbooks. What's really going on is that the United States has been in a very long, protracted decline since about the 1960s. It emerged from the post-war undoubtedly with productive superiority, and it attempted to impose on the world an order which it would control, but it could not because that world was already full of nation-states, including nation-states which were rivals to it, which it had to support, such as Japan and Germany needed to support them, not out of some need to construct a, an empire or hegemony, but because it needed a buffer against the revolutions which had been taking place both in China and also uh, the continuing uh, process of uh, basically production of, uh, of states which were defending themselves against the worst depredations of capitalism, whatever we think of the means that they used to do that. So my answer is, it never was. And what there was, which was a policy and not a theory, is actually in serious decline, and we are now seeing the crisis of that, uh, that, 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 that economy and its influence in the world. So the next question you say, some people say the theory of Marx won because we finally see the financial crash. Can we renew his theories and adopt for today's needs? In the talk that I'm going to give... I stress that the question we now face is a very important practical one. We have to know what to do next. Now, why does that bear on what Marx had to say? Well, if a lot of people are suffering and they're out of work and they're having their standards of living cut because of this financial crash, then nobody has won. Not even the capitalists have won. Only the, there are only losers. The real problem was that what Marx sought to do, I think, was not so much set up governments. He wanted to explain to people who were going to do that how they needed to do that in a rational way. So his explanation is essentially what's at stake, not, not, not Marx in some sense, the, the winner or the loser. And I would say, so far he is the loser because he was trying to stop people behaving in a stupid way and they are behaving in an extremely stupid way. So as yet, he has not succeeded. It's only when people get more enlightened we can say that he would have succeeded, and that's up to us. That's something we have to work on. We have to both correct all the terrible mistakes and um, errors of judgment and theory that have been made both by politicians and by academics over the last period, and we have to put in place better and more practical policies so I'm going to give two examples of this. One, you now see all over the advanced industrial world policies of so-called austerity. So what they do is they try to get out of the fact that they have a debt by taking money out of the economy. This is the exact opposite of what is required. It's uh, known to be stupid. Marx explained the stupidity of it many years ago. 
and um, others also, such as Keynes, has explained why that's stupid. And the reason it's stupid is the following. If the government's not like a household, it's not as if you have some kind of money coming in from the outside, and if you don't spend it, you keep it. The government's money comes out of tax, it comes out of the economy. If, therefore, the economy runs down, because the government isn't spending any money, and because nobody else is spending money, then all that happens is the government gets less tax, and its deficit increases. Now, probably the worst, most doctrinaire case is Britain, where you see that they came to office and said, oh, we'll have three years of austerity, we'll get the debt under control. And now they're saying it's going to go on until 2018. Well, I'll tell you something, it will go on forever, because you cannot remove the debt by cutting. What you have to do is remove the debt by expanding the economy. Now, here's the second thing that Marx explained which, again, is something that I think generations of academics and politicians and financiers have striven, might and main, to stop us understanding. That is that the capitalist economy itself generates from inside itself long-term tendencies to stop itself working. So one of these, probably foremost, is the decline of investment and decline of investment happens for a number of reasons. I think that one of the most important is the explanation that Marx has given us, which is the long-term tendency of the rate of profit to fall. One doesn't necessarily have to accept that. The most important thing that we now need to agree on is that the, the capitalist economy runs down investment. And it, what it does when it's not investing is the money that would have gone into production goes into Places where it doesn't make any wealth, it goes into piles of money just sitting under beds, or the modern form of that is it goes into the banks, and the, and the banks just pass it round amongst each other. They don't actually make it work in the sense of creating any new value by employing people, which is the way you have to use money if you want to make things work and grow. So the only way, and there is much historical evidence for that, that you can get out of that is if the state steps in. I did a piece of research in 2008. I've got a website where you can go and look it out called How Much Is Enough? Right at the beginning of this crisis, in which I said this crisis is not just an ordinary business cycle, it's something like what we saw in 1929 to 1933, which we saw again in, uh, not again, but before in 1873 to 1893, which at the time was called the Long Depression in which you get, after these very long climb reclines of capitalism, a very long period of stagnation and low growth. Now, um, uh, Russia is home to a very well-known economist called Kondratyev, who had a theory of the so-called long cycle, and he believed, along with another economist called Schumpeter, that when you got into these declines that came at the end of this, uh, sorry, when you get these long depressions coming at the end of these long declines, Capitalism will, in some sense, restore itself. I, I think this is not true. This is definitively proven that it will not be the case, and Marx's analysis does help us to understand that. In actual fact, when capitalism has recovered from such long depressions before, it has always been because the state has spent an enormous amount of money. And what I did in the article I've just mentioned is I simply look at how we got out of the 1929 to 1933 recession. And the answer is that we did not get out through the New Deal. We did not get out until first Germany and Japan, in that case with fascist governments, began to spend massively on gearing up for the war. But finally and most decisively, when the American government spent 48% of GDP gearing up for the war. And that started in 1942. So if you go back to 1873, they got out of that by another military expansion. That was the age of imperialism. The great arms race, all of everybody building dreadnoughts and battles and battleships and so on, and uh, ended up in the First World War. So they get out of these. The only known way that private capitalism gets out of these crises is by military spending. Now, what Marx tells us is we need to get out of them by peaceful means. That means the state has to enormously invest and invest in people. And I've got quite a lot of work I'm going to present which says that the two things we have to do is invest in um, 
what I call culture and creative industries, and the expansion of the human spirit in education, in art, in culture, that is now actually the fastest growing sector of even private capitalist economy. It accounts for one in every five jobs in London. The Chinese government is successfully and massively investing in that area of expansion. And it goes together with another area in which we have to invest, which is the new technology of resource saving and energy saving. This has also reached a tipping point now. It is actually becoming in many countries of the world, including Germany, cheaper to install solar, wind and other sources of sustainable energy than to continue burning coal. This has happened without people really noticing. And in actual fact, an extraordinary thing is happening, which is that the German government is holding back the installation of new green ecological power systems because they're worried about the effect on the economy of closing coal-fired power stations, if you can believe that. It's, for a country like Russia, exactly the opposite. The most dangerous thing would be to remain dependent on oil, which is a resource which I think in 20 years' time we'll probably kiss by goodbye to, just as uh, we've kissed goodbye to uh, coal, even in the days of Lady Thatcher. She actually sounded the death knell of coal. We all have some sounding of the death knell of oil, and to be left dependent on it is crazy. You have to invest in the technology of the future. Russia and China, BRICS countries, have to be the countries which will overtake the West, which is unable to develop these new technologies, and at the same time that it's saving on resources, building a new sustainable economy, it has to be investing primarily in the human spirit. Now that doesn't mean that you should not also be investing in infrastructure, on the contrary. You can only educate people, you can only give them time to think and create if you actually build houses, schools, cities, if you create every means by which people can develop themselves as humans. And particularly for a less developed country such as Russia and for BRICS countries like China and Brazil, that's the fundamental priority. So, in summary, Marx outlined the program that was necessary. It's called Combined Development. The state should lead. It should invest in new, the most latest new technology. It should place investment in humans at the centre of what it does. It should respect our relationship to nature. And we've now reached the point where that is actually practical and it's the only way out of the crisis. So when, when governments and countries begin to adopt that sort of policy, when governments and countries begin to adopt that sort of policy, I would be happy to say that Marx has won. So the next question I will answer very briefly, you've said that we can speak of the end of globalization. Now, I wrote a book with uh, Boris Kagalitsky in 2004, in which we said two things. One, globalization never really was. It was, as I said, a policy imposed as a theory of history. But secondly, it was in crisis. It was breaking up. And I think that today what we're seeing um, is the real vindication and proof of that. In fact, one of the things I'm looking at is whether we can produce a new edition of that very prophetic book. I was very pleased to be working with Boris on that, and I think it was um, a real step forward in theory. What uh, we at the time diagnosed is something different, which I call continentalization. And I did some calculations looking at which continental land masses were growing the fastest. In every case, they were the land masses that had the least inequality between the nations in that continent and the most economic integration. Top, actually, at that time was Europe. Now, in actual fact, they are now in crisis, but precisely because they won't take the step they need to take, which is to continue that process of economic integration by fiscal redistribution, by fiscal redistribution between their, their countries. So uh, Germany will not do what actually has to be done, which is to actually inject large amounts of money into the Greek economy to reconstitute the demand for its products. And of course, this, this is absolutely insane. Germany says, we're successful, we have this great export model, it's these uh, lazy Greeks, Italians, Portuguese and so on who are dragging us down. Let's drive them into austerity. What do they find? They can't afford to buy German products anymore. And the German export miracle crashes into the dust. So another example of the craziness when people don't just do some simple thinking, including listening to Marx. 
But at that time, in 2004, it was, it, was, it was very successful precisely because of the level of integration. The next, actually, was Latin America, which had quite a high level of integration, and that's progressed, which is another reason that Latin America is moving forward. Then you have economies which are continental in their own right, of which the two most important are America and China. And I think one of the reasons, apart from the policy, which is very important that China has followed, that it's been able to take full advantage of its own resources and deal with the crisis of the, of the, of the, um, the advanced countries, is the continental scale on which it's operating. There are problems of inequality between regions, but uh, the policies that are being adopted that attempt to redress that, you can see in and of themselves the extent to which they're replenishing the demand that is being lost because of the um, decline in the export markets because of the crisis in the West. And it's because basically the USA and now China are continental that they can get economies of scale, they can get a sufficiently large internal domestic market that they can uh, decouple themselves when there are external crises that threaten their economies. They don't become as export dependent as, they, as, as other countries are, uh, despite what people say about China. It's not so export dependent um, as many people think. That requires a continental scale. The economies of scale in industry require a continental scale. And those continents which are bringing themselves closer together are those which we found in 2004 were the most successful. Now, as to Russia, the opposite was the case. The collapse of the USSR resulted in a phenomenal increase in inequality between the various components of the USSR because it broke up their natural economic unity. Now, I know that there are immense social and political issues involved in bringing back together some sort of economic block. But economically, you only have to look at where those countries are situated. And the need for an economic uh, unity, a continental unity, is absolutely stark staring obvious. And the failure to do that is one of the reasons behind the reason, behind the fact that the, the, the uh, ex-USSR uh, countries have not done so well. And so uh, part of what needs to be done is continentalization. And I'll just say in passing that if you look at what the USA actually tries to do in its strategies, it, it doesn't try to globalize. It tries to break countries up. So the whole initiative they took towards Yugoslavia, towards the USSR, towards Russia, is to chop bits of it off, destroy its unity, so that that can help them maintain uh, their economic dominance and increasingly destructive dominance for the rest of the world. So what is waiting for the dollar as a major world currency? Well, in a certain sense, that follows from what I said about continentalization. I don't, I don't subscribe to the theory of hegemony, and I'm extremely dubious that the whole project of a single world currency as opposed to a single world debt clearing system, which is what Keynes proposed, is actually practical. And what people are actually doing is they're making uh, a series of step-by-step -step regional alternatives, such as the, uh, the financial integration that's taking place in Latin America. And that's what makes sense, is continental currencies. Then, of course, they have to construct trading relations between themselves, which deals with the ways in which they can help each other. Now, that's the opposite of what IMF proposes, which is the, the complementarity, as they call it, between the economies of the third world and the advanced world, is the advanced world will supply the capital and the third world will supply the labour. That's just a recipe for a new slavery, and it, it hasn't worked. It doesn't work. What you want is the natural complementarity, that some countries have more resources, some countries have different climates, some countries have developed certain areas of technology better, and you can have a mutually beneficial cooperative exchange between countries that are at a similar level. And that brings me to the last question, which is the real reason that you have this phenomenon of the BRICS is a combination of all the things that I've just mentioned, which is what they're doing. You have a growing involvement of the state, the refusal to just accept the private investors and just get on with what they want to do. You have continental orientation, a sensible orientation, more or less, to surrounding economies to attempt to bring about that economic unity, setting up of uh, continental financial institutions to buffer 
those organisations against world markets, in fact decoupling in many respects from the worst of the world financial markets, not accepting the dollar's hegemony, not holding all your reserves in the dollar, which is increasingly going on. Um, so they're doing that, they're, they're, they're continentally integrating, setting up alternative financial structures, and they're beginning to set up trade relations between themselves, which work. So the extent to which they succeed in doing that, and Russia can play a big role because it's, it's less involved than the others, it's less advanced than the other BRICS countries in that respect. Uh, of course, the worst, the worst of that is, is South Africa, which has a, probably the worst, does the least of these things and therefore has the biggest problems. But um, that is the process, and it's, again, it's, it's not the inevitable march of history. It's a policy decision. It's what we do. Thank you very much.